Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Executive Editor of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining this month's installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, The Chief Data Officer's Agenda. This month, John Ladley and Tony Shaw are joined by Bill Tannenbaum, who will discuss how CDOs should work with lawyers. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen, or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag CDO data strategy. As always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. And then let me introduce to you our moderators for today. Well-known industry analyst John Ladley is a business technology thought leader and recognized authority in all aspects of enterprise information management. With 30 years experience in planning, project management, improving IT organization, organizations, and successful implementation of information systems. As president of IMQ Solutions, he leads a consultancy focused on improving a client's business results through information management and data governance. With John is Dataverse City's own CEO, Tony Shaw. Tony of, is, of course, responsible for the business strategy of the company and its subsidiaries, including Dataversity, all of which conduct educational conferences, training, and publishing activities focused on the area of enterprise data management. And with that, I will turn it over to Tony to get us started and introduce this month's guest speaker. Hello and welcome. Thank you very much, Shannon. Um, hello to John, my colleague, and welcome to everybody who's uh, listening in today. Um, the, uh, the genesis of this particular presentation is uh, actually a talk that Bill Tenenbaum gave during the CDO Vision Conference in Washington, D.C. at the end of March. And um, we invited Bill to talk a little bit about governance and security and some of the legal issues involved there. And I, I think we're all, um, maybe with the exception of Bill, a little surprised at the, the level of a discussion that was provoked amongst the audience of senior data management people. Uh, um, certainly, um, the, the presentation opened the eyes of many of the folks in the audience as to um, uh, the range of issues that are impacting data management today, the, the, the range of legal issues that are impacting data management today, um, but also the number of ways in which um, having some greater awareness of, of uh, those issues and the context of data in the uh, sort of legal uh, environment today uh, can enable chief data officers and strategists and, and designers even to add value to a number of important business functions and practices uh, in contemporary commercial uh, environment. So, um, because of that, uh, we invited Bill back to provide an extension of, of some of those uh, topics uh, during his presentation today. Um, Bill will talk for about 40 minutes and then we'll have plenty of time for questions afterwards. Um, uh, just as a procedural note, uh, if you could make your questions out uh, in the Q&A section in the bottom right hand corner of the screen, that would be terrific and uh, offer those at any point during the presentation. Um, we'll save most of them to the end, but uh, I think Bill's willing for us to interrupt him too as we go along. Um, uh, so let me introduce Bill at this point. Um, uh, Bill Tannenbaum is the head of K Scholars uh, Intellectual Property and Technology Transactions Group, K Scholar, sorry. Um, so, uh, uh, Bill has something of a technical background uh, in addition to his legal training, uh, and he was in fact named Lawyer of the Year in Information Technology Year uh, by uh, Best Lawyers publication in 2013. He's a past president of the International Technology Law Association. His practice focuses primarily on IP and technology, including transactions and litigation, strategic counseling, and um, one of the things that makes him particularly relevant to our, our presentation today is uh, his expertise in the use and commercialization of data as an asset. Bill's a, a vice president of the Society for Information Management, and because of his technical background, he also works very closely with CIOs 
uh, chief technology officers, chief information security officers, and chief data officers. So, Bill, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Looking forward to your presentation, and I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Tony. It's certainly my pleasure to, to be here. And I do want to affirm that I'm glad to take questions as we move through the presentation. Uh, my topic is on kind of the hidden legal issues that CDOs need to deal with and where and how CDOs should play a role in what would otherwise be an IT contract that their company is entering into. Uh, since I am a lawyer, I do need to start with a disclaimer. So here goes my disclaimer, which is what I have to say today does not constitute the opinions of my firm, Kay Scholler. It does not constitute the opinions of any of Kay Scholler's clients, and it does not constitute my own opinions. I'd like to start with uh, setting the stage by defining some of the types of data that uh, CDOs have to deal with in order so I can uh, follow the, the kind of paradigm I want to use, which is the business drivers should be driving the legal issues. Um, and with respect to IT and particularly IP, you should know that once you decide on your business objective, um, IP is flexible enough so that you can use intellectual property licenses to end up where your business uh, wants to go. So that's another way of saying that uh, IP is not a tail that wags the dog, but it's a tool to accomplish uh, your business objectives. For our purposes today, I'm going to discuss enterprise data in the context of data that is used within a company primarily for its own internal operations. Uh, at the speech Tony uh, mentioned, uh, another speaker said that uh, she worked for a company uh, that consisted primarily of, of financial advisors. So kind of a core question for that company is how many financial advisors do we have? And the problem that was identified was that businesses uh, throughout the organization took different metrics on deciding who was counted as a financial advisor. Uh, some financial advisors were deemed not to count because they didn't have enough assets under control or enough of their own clients. And the point was uh, the organization didn't really know because different parts of the organization used different metrics. So that, that's an example of problems in enterprise data. Uh, and it's also a problem when you look outward at your customers. Um, because there's a question of, are you you? Some companies are starting to combine their brick and mortar customers with their online customers for fairly obvious reasons that people shop through both channels. Um, but if the company is set up with very siloed data, then it's missing an opportunity to combine that data and use it to develop better products, which is a subject I'll get to later. And the data question becomes, how are you identifying a customer? And if you're identifying them using different uh, measurement criteria, whether they're in the store or online, then you're not going to have an accurate sense of, of how many you have and probably more difficult to figure out who shops through both channels. So that's the enterprise data that I want to focus on. That obviously leads to a lot of data from a lot of sources, and big data is kind of the overarching terminology for this. It traditionally is defined in terms of the three Vs, which are volume, velocity, and variety. Bill, uh, I apologize for interrupting. I'm not seeing the slides move. Are you changing the slides? Yeah, I'm not ready for the second one, but I will get there shortly. <laughs> and, Sorry. Okay. It's okay. okay there. <laughs> and uh, so I'll just continue, continue on so that um, the, the fourth aspect of this is intensity. And that's the really new thing that can be measured by monitoring social media. You can decide whether customers are very, very interested in something or whether your employees um, have problems with your travel policy or the like. Um, the data also comes not only from your own sources, but from sources where you buy it from, from the Internet of Things, uh, from what's volunteered by your customers. Uh, 
Um, there is also data that needs to be used, and this is a legal point, when there's an investigation being conducted of your company by a regulatory agency or an attorney general. Um, so you need to have that data, and people will look to the CTO, CTO to get that data organized. And the last part of the data is the data that's not used as enterprise data for internal purposes, but data that you want to consider an asset and monetize. And the last comment I'll make before I advance to the next slide is the role between the CDO and the CIO. Um, and for most purposes, there is a division and there is a difference. Um, the IT infrastructure is generally not the responsibility of the chief data officer. So another way to look at this is there's content and there's infrastructure, and the CIO is responsible for the pipes, and the CDO is responsible for interpreting the water that flows out of the pipes. And of course, it's not a strict division, because in order to do what you need to do from a data point of view, you do need to have the support of your, um, your IT infrastructure. One of the big problems that companies face, of course, is uh, database breaches, which exposes them not only to legal liability, but to reputational harm. And this is something that CDOs need to be aware of because it's both a potential problem for them and an area that they're potentially responsible for. So as the slide indicates, the study indicated that about two-thirds of significant database breaches were actually caused by third parties, IT providers, and either mistakes that they made, innocent or otherwise, or limitations to the technology that they use. So one of the thrusts of my discussion will be you know, taking care that outsourcing or hiring a technology provider um, is not going to be the avenue that leads to your data leaking out and liability for a database breach. So where does the CDO fit in the context of the risk of third parties causing your breach? Um, there's usually a problem that, the, uh, especially in the outsourcing or technology services operations of a company, that the CDO is not involved in the process. Many of these processes start with a request for proposal that goes out to the vendors. Um, in many cases, especially where procurement is heavily involved as opposed to strategic outsourcing uh, management, uh, the RFP scoring will focus on the lowest price, which tends to make it expensive for a provider to provide good data security which means there's more incentive to aim at the low price than there is to bake in security into the product. Even if uh, security is given attention, in choosing the vendors, the RFP needs to focus on data security as one of the measures that's scored. And without the involvement of the CDO, there's probably going to be a lack of sensitivity to making this an important uh, qualification for selecting the vendor. Uh, assuming that the contract has now gone forward, one of the recommendations that I make is that in addition to the account manager and the equivalent um, responsible party on the customer side, since we're dealing with data, we need to have data managers on both sides of the fence who have the relevant skills and expertise particularly on how data works and the IT that supports it, and some knowledge of the legal risks that are going to uh, arise out of this. In most outsourcing agreements, there is a, a difference between the deal team and the operations team. And the deal team is the set of people who negotiate the contracts. And after the contracts are negotiated, uh, these professional negotiators and outside lawyers uh, go away and the internal operations team takes over running the process. Um, because there's a difference, I recommend that the customer allow the potential outside vendor providing data services to have access to the operations team. Uh, the legal advantage of this to the CDO is that the vendor will have a good insight into both the strengths and the weaknesses of a company's operations. Um, and that will lead to 
perhaps sharing information to fine tune the services. Uh, if the operations teams are good, there'll be a better price because the vendor doesn't have to build in a buffer for unknown contingencies. Moving on to the multi-vendor part of the next bullet point, uh, I think CDOs need to be aware that it's smart to use a vendor management organization where different vendors are put in different categories and different categories are handed differently. So at the top of this pyramid would be the strategic uh, providers or vendors. And below that would be vendors who are important but not part of the strategic operations. Below that would be the uh, infrastructure providers. And then below that would be the kind of commodity providers. And I'll say the cloud services um, that can fit in all of these categories. Um, so you need to be aware of how new technology does this. And from a data point of view, you know, if you go to an outside provider using cloud, you often get the data science built into that operation. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. But as you go through vendor management and try and allocate the time and negotiation effort that you spend on these contracts, it's important to follow the hierarchy that I outlined um, and make sure that on your strategic vendors you're getting the kind of cooperation you need um, for data. And one of the big issues, of course, is that in any of these operations, and particularly with the speed with which big data and concomitant uh, data, I'm sorry, data analytics are progressing, what you do next year will be something you didn't know that you could do. So you need a strategic partner that's a little bit extra legal and that you are going to find a way to trust and to work together to make the adjustments um, to improve the services based on, as I said, something that isn't known at the time you enter into the agreement. So the final point on this slide is when you have a database breach resulting from an outside provider, often it's because the insights of the CDO were not built into the process or the company didn't pay enough attention to what those insights were. So both those problems need to be addressed. On the next slide, I'm going to focus on where the CDO fits in making sure that the contracts are doing the job they need to do. So let's start with the contracts that the company already has. Um, there's two aspects to this. One is data security and one is data mining and enterprise use. The problem will be in many cases that the older contracts from a security point of view use older technology in the face of newer threats, which means that the technology can't handle the threats. And since the technology can't handle the threats, then the obligations of the vendors to address those threats is going to be limited by the technology that they're um, entitled to use, but not better technology. Um, from a data mining point of view, it's a similar problem but it's more a business limitation than legal liability. But the business problem is, is that the technology is not set up to enable the kind of analytics that um, today's technology would provide. So going back to um, the 63% of the problems being caused by IT limitations in the vendor side, uh, you need to do essentially a gap analysis of what your company needs, both from a security and analytics point of view. And then as the next point says, you can remediate this through renegotiations. In some cases, it's fairly easy because the agreements have shorter terms than they used to, and they're coming up for renewal. In today's economic environment, you can go and say they need to be reopened. And that usually results in getting greater protections for something, eliminating some things from the scope that you've decided you don't need anymore, and making a price adjustment that accounts for what's in and what's out. So an example of something that might change is uh, just to pick an easy IT example. If uh, you had outsourced a help desk uh, and spent a lot of money on it and now have replaced it by what amounts to a voicemail system, well, you can reduce the scope of, of help desk operations uh, in the course of renegotiating the agreement. 
vendors are more concerned with margins than revenue, so you need to be focused on that and not get waylaid by that. The new contracts um, provide an opportunity to kind of use the same lessons that you would use in existing contract analyses. So you would do the same kind of gap, gap analysis between what you want to have happen and making sure it's in the new contract. And this goes back to the point on the last slide that this is the great opportunity for the CDOs to be involved in a meaningful way and make a contribution to the whole process, starting with the RFP and other issues that I addressed in talking about the last slide. Let me move on now. To the next topic, which is privacy. Um, the title of this is Privacy is Contextual. And I'm going to set the stage by saying for, for purposes of this discussion, privacy is kind of a, of a shorthand. But what we're really talking about is personal information, information that's not personal but confidential to a company because it relates not to individuals but to company plans and trade secrets. Um, and so with those two things in mind, we go to the fundamental issue, which is who sees what information and for what purposes? And that's what makes it, in my mind, a contextual issue. Because who sees what information for what purposes are three variables that are going to change depending on what the purpose is. Um, and different information is necessary and different access is necessary to that information or allowable for that information depending on the purpose. So one size fits all does not work. An example would be a pharmacy or other company that is setting up uh, an ancillary hearing clinic on the theory that people will come, have their hearing tested, and walk next door and buy a hearing aid and the concomitant services that go with supporting it. In order to do that hearing aid um, medical examination, some prior medical history will need to be provided. The problem is that there's no reason and uh, a customer slash patient in this context will not want his entire medical history disclosed when it's irrelevant to determining what the hearing problem is. And what's the problem? The problem is it, it's not binary. It shouldn't be all or nothing. It should be contextual. And how are we going to get there? Well, there's too much information stored in too many electronic, semi, or completely automated systems for human beings to go in and sort out what's relevant. And that's going to drive us to using software agents to make this decision. And that's where the IT comes in and the CDO needs to cooperate with the CIO and make sure that the software is smart enough to make those decisions. One of the issues that will come up is whether there's going to be customized software that's going to be added to a standard offering. And the businessman solution is if I'm paying for custom software, I should own it. I want to very, very quickly say that I think that should uh, be rethought and it shouldn't be an automatic position. And you should go back to figuring out what the business drivers are for creating the software in the first place. So if the standalone custom software can really have monetary value, then that's an argument for having the customer own it. If, however, it can't be used by itself and there's no plan on monetizing it, then there's an argument, and a strong one, that it should be owned by the provider, by the vendor. And there are various legal advantages of that. If it gets folded into the vendor's standard offerings, then the vendor will support it, we'll put the A team on it, we'll protect it with indemnities and representations, and that takes a big load off the CDO's responsibility for um, making sure that the data gets analyzed because the software is in good shape. On the next slide, I'm going to address intellectual property. And this is always the question with data, which is, who owns it? Um, and the short answer is it's from an intellectual property point of view, um, not the complete answer. There's patent, copyright, and trade secret protection. Trade secret protection is pretty easy. If you declare it a secret, put in policies to keep it secret, and then it's yours. 
from a patent perspective, the algorithm that does the analytics may or may not be patentable. Um, from a copyright perspective, that would protect uh, the databases, but not necessarily the underlying facts. And the underlying facts must be um, what's protected. In my experience, when you have uh, you know, a fairly complex operation, every entity that's involved in the operation thinks that it owns the data. And then you get into huge fights about who owns it when ownership is not really clear under the law in the first place. So I would propose a new paradigm that uh, you focus on data sharing as opposed to purely uh, deciding ownership and then going from there. So how would that work in a legal context? It would work that the companies say whatever IP they own, they own, and we're not sorting out the fine lines between ownership. And then they're contributing uh, by a licensed technology, by a licensed technique rather, a way to share that data because using and sharing the data is actually more important than, than ownership. And the contract will what give will be the vehicle that defines the scope of sharing and the obligations and the rights that go along with sharing. Uh, so now we get to the point where you're doing the data sharing and yes data is an asset but because IP is limited then you need to address this in a contract. Um, so as the next point says, uh, for lawyers that means it's a private rather than a statutory arrangement. So your contract is really writing your own law and that's perfectly fine and that's what lawyers do for you. Uh, the intellectual property comes in when you do a derivative data set that has a competitive advantage. That is something you're going to try and own and a derivative data set is easier to own from an intellectual property point of view than raw data. And from a contractual point of view, um, it's easy to make that work. Open source is a risk. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, open source um, carries the risk that you can use the open source software, but you can't build a proprietary system on top of it because Open source requires you to make it available uh, to the public for them to use. Um, so uh, different open source license agreements provide for different kinds of public use and it's important to make sure that you, that you pick the right version of that. Uh, I've already addressed customization so I won't go through that. Joint ownership has the same issue which is um, when it gets complicated in collaborative improvements, the parties will say, well, we'll just share the ownership. The important IP point here is that joint ownership under IP has unexpected consequences. The chief one is, is that the joint owner can license to your competitor uh, without you having the right to stop that unless the contract goes otherwise. And um, therefore, I think joint ownership carries some risks that need to be addressed. Uh, I have a question about complying with EU, uh, the EU law or directive or equivalent laws. Um, that's a very complicated issue, uh, but in the context of compliance, uh, the EU protection basically requires that nothing can be done without express consent of the data subjects. So that's a lot more restrictive than the terms of use than you see in U.S. type website agreements and things like that. Um, you do need to comply. Um, it's hard to make it the highest common denominator because that does limit things that you're free to do in the United States. And from a legal point of view, the problem will be that the marketing department wants to commingle all this data and commingling restricted European data with unrestricted U.S. data um, creates a problem for compliance. So that's an issue we'll come back to if we have more time with everyone's understanding that it's a great question but a very complicated one. Bill, How long this is keep data? Yeah. Bill, uh, can I interrupt you just a moment before you move on to this next slide? You, you talked about um, special conditions or circumstances around derivative data sets. Um, could you give an example of, of a derivative what a derivative data set is or, or is not. So yes, I'd be glad to do that. So let's say that you have all this data out there um, that you've collected from 
you know, your own uh, customers' uh, sales information. You've gone out and you've bought some information about those those same customers, so you know a little bit more about them, and if they buy luxury goods or take a lot of travel or have kids, whatever it is you need to know. Uh, and then you're kind of combining that with what they are saying or what general information you're getting through social media and, and all the ways in which comments can be disseminated, disseminated in today's world. So the data set would be taking all that information and saying that our business purpose is X. We want to uh, provide this service or provide that product to a target uh, demographic. And so you take that information, you filter it, and you end up with a subset of those people and a subset of attributes that um, you've culled from all the possible attributes, or at least all the available ones, to the ones that really matter to you. And now you have a database that's, that's very much focused on particular needs. From an intellectual property point of view, you've done something that makes that easier to own than just putting together a bunch of facts because you've, uh, in intellectual property terms, you've put some structure and some purpose on why you're collecting stuff. So that's something that you can own and you would want to own it because it provides a competitive advantage and that would mean that you're going to restrict third parties from using it. On the other hand, you may want to monetize it and sell it because it has value because it has done something important. So, Tony, have I addressed that issue? Uh, yes, certainly. I wouldn't mind betting it comes up a bit later on, too. Okay, so let me um, go through the slides and then we can come back and revisit this. But I think the, yep. the, the core point is that to make you know, enterprise data useful, um, you have to turn it into some subset of all the flood of information that you have, um, and including information that comes from the Internet of Things, where you're getting a lot of sensor-driven uh, information, um, and some of it isn't relevant for some purposes and is relevant for other purposes. Um, and because, uh, just to repeat what I said, you know, having tailored data is what makes the data useful for you. That's where both the business intelligence is and maybe the artificial intelligent agents that apply to it. Um, you want to create it and then protect it the best way you can. The point of, of focusing on data sets is that they're more susceptible to intellectual property protection than is the big hunk of data that forms the raw materials. So I'm going to move on now and welcome questions as I go. Uh, how long to keep data? This one I'll discuss relatively quickly in light of the time. Everybody is familiar with uh, data retention policies that lawyers use to decide how long to keep data and how long not to keep data. Uh, from that point of view is that you don't want to have extra data hanging around in case there's a lawsuit because it only provides uh, a risk. The coming conflict is is that I think the business side of the fence sees monetary value in keeping data longer than that ordinary provision, the data retention provision would be for litigation risk purposes. And so you have a conflict essentially between mitigating risk and maximizing revenue. Uh, and companies are sorting this out now and we're giving advice on it as to how do you accommodate both goals um, without running undue risk and giving up an acceptable measure of revenue in order to mitigate some of that risk. So I think this is going to be a huge problem that companies haven't really focused on. And then we get back to the fact that it's contextual, that you, know, you don't need to keep all the big data that you have. Data itself has a life cycle, and eventually why keep it because it's not useful. Um, and uh, not all data that's useful needs to be kept. So you need to come up with some metrics and then again some software agents that get rid of this, all in discussion with regulatory compliance people. So that's another way of saying that CDOs just can't avoid the legal consequences of collecting these terrific data sets. Uh, another point that I haven't made on this slide is where there's a value from a litigation point of view to getting rid of the data, there's also a value to keeping it because it can be exculpatory as well as incriminating. Um, and that has to be taken into effect 
into account when you try and decide what the legal risk really is. So now we're coming to another avenue of security breaches. Uh, and in my mind, bring your own device to work is really a little limited. It's really bring your own infrastructure to work. Because when employees think that their teenagers have a better IT system than their companies do, they're just going to use everything that they can get through through their smartphone, whether it's an app or whether it's a Dropbox or something like that. And the nature of the Internet is if you're not paying for a product, then you're the product. So that means a lot of information that's being stored on uh, some cloud service through your smartphone um, is probably going to be collected and used uh, by the provider. Um, and that becomes a risk to the company. So companies need to try and set some rules up and basically provide enough of an infrastructure so that it doesn't all have to be bring your own because the company is providing the right kind of apps on the right kind of smartphones to, to do a good mixture between the flexibility that that world provides but the same security that the company provides. And at the extreme end, there can be a risk if your company is a critical infrastructure and you're a target for state actors or malicious criminals. Um, and while it's great to get that information, it's not great to have that be a source of a security breach. Uh, everyone talks about cloud. I think cloud has passed the point where it can be considered to be a completely uh, disruptive technology. It's not disruptive because it's here. And it's here because smartphones won't work without it. And if the goal is to have data everywhere, anytime, then cloud is probably going to be the way it's going to go. And everybody's aware of security issues in the cloud. My estimation is they'll probably be solved uh, in, in great part. And your cloud provider may actually provide better security than your existing IT provider does. Um, but it's no longer disruptive, and therefore um, it provides value in how to manipulate and collect data and it's something that should be embraced rather than avoided. Uh, and I've already talked about how smartphones are now the way in which a lot happens. To put a finer point on that, I would say that uh, the movement from you know, desktop PCs to handheld mobile devices is as big an inflection point as the movement was between uh, mainframe computers and desktop PCs. So my last slide focuses on uh, what I view is um, the approach I'm working through and recommending to clients with respect to how do you deal with uh, persistent attacks and what approach should you take in a world where you're constantly being probed or hacked in ways you may or may not know. Um, a more traditional approach is to outline some SLAs, outline some penalties, and say uh, that the vendor has this responsibility and um, we're measuring it by SLAs, and if they fail the SLAs, then there's a penalty or a breach or some contractual harm that results for which there's a remedy. And there's two limitations to that. Number one, uh, the SLAs might not measure something which is a harmful breach. And number two, in the event of a breach, what is your real goal? Your real goal is to stop it from happening now and to prevent it from happening in the future and learn what you need to learn. Because with these persistent state actors and criminals, they will ultimately get in if they really, really want to. Um, so I think a better approach is to model private agreements on what companies and critical infrastructures now do with the FBI. So if you're a big company that does defense work and you get hacked by China, and most times you cooperate with the FBI or another agency and, and kind of work together to figure out who attacked you and how to stop it. I think that idea can be ported over to private contracts. And rather than have people fight about what a breach is and in the set, and that, that moment have the breach continue, move more towards a theory that it's more important to allow the vendor to be honest about what did go wrong 
and use that as a joint uh, set of information about how to improve it going forward. And my final point is that one of the big ways in which companies get uh, hacked is through what's called whaling, which is the IT department erects all these defenses and some senior executive who frankly is probably um, the least likely of all the employees to rigidly adhere to all the security practices gets an email. And he gets an email with a grammatical error. And I believe that the grammatical errors are, you know, not the result of somebody who doesn't know how to speak English, but it's actually a business strategy. And why do I say that? Um, for somebody who's very IT savvy, they're going to look at this and they're going to just disregard it and delete it in case it has some malware and just get it off of their system. For someone who is less fine-tuned to that, they're going to open it up. Um, they're going to be sympathetic to a message that purports to come from a high from a high school buddy who is trapped in Mexico and lost his passport and needs $1,000 to get home. Um, so somebody who isn't aware of the IT and is kind of sympathetic to that will open it up um, and then the malware will come in. So I just want to caution people that in my mind that is a grammatical error constituting a business strategy and, and that's the real risk to the company. So with that, Tony, I'm uh, uh, going to stop, consistent with our time for questions, and uh, okay. turn it back over to you and to the audience and invite all the questions okay. that people do have. Um, John, why don't you jump in with your first question? Sure. Um, my first one is uh, going to pose a scenario which is fairly common to a lot of our listeners who are uh, bringing up some type of data management or data governance uh, uh, program. And three things can happen. They discover some deficiency, uh, either through data profiling or a survey or something, but there is a deficiency that could uh, be interpreted as a legal uh, risk. Um, uh, corporate legal does one of three things. They say, oh my gosh, that's horrible. Please uh, destroy all evidence of that. Uh, we here at ACME uh, or, you know, Space Lease Sprockets are perfect. Uh, we don't do things wrong. We don't want anything in writing. Uh, the second thing is they say, well, you better fix it uh, and keep us in the loop as to how you fix it uh, because that is legitimate risk and we want you to make sure it's fixed. The third thing is, oh, my gosh, that's terribly horrible. Um, we want to take over your data governance program and make it part of our legal uh department. Um, which of those three scenarios do you see being uh, preferred uh, these days, uh, or which ones do you have a particular issue with? Well, I think the preferred one is to find a way to effectively combine, uh, you know, those people in the legal office or in the compliance office which are concerned with risk. Um, you know, from their point of view, compliance is not optional. So that means you have to work backwards from those requirements and make sure that the the data system uh, works with that. And um, I lost a little bit about the other two scenarios. So if I can ask you to kind of summarize those again, I want to tailor my response. Sure, and I'll use the uh, handset too. We might have lost something in the, the speaker phone. The first scenario is the most interesting one where you uh, are told, um, um, well, whatever you found out, uh, don't write it down um, and uh, don't worry about it. Uh, we don't make those kinds of mistakes here at uh, Space Lease Brockets. Um, so it's essentially um, don't build your program around fixing that problem because we don't acknowledge that's a problem. We won't put that in writing that we have a problem. Uh, the second uh, problem is uh, please go ahead and fix it. Uh, we acknowledge the risk and keep us in the loop so we can make sure that it is in uh, compliance and adheres to law. The third one, uh, which has actually happened, uh, I've seen happen, is legal takes over data governance and says, um, nope, that's our project. There's enough risk here that we need to actually drive uh, the data processes uh, in conjunction with whoever has the top data job. So those are the quick review. Those are the three again. 
Okay, so on the last one, um, the lawyers can't do it unless they really understand the data, the marketing, and the technology. Um, and it's always easy to be so risk adverse that you undermine some of the potential upside. So, uh, you know, I think siloing that completely, um, and speaking as a lawyer without getting the input from the business and the IT people, uh, doesn't serve the company well. Uh, you know, to go back to the first one about don't write anything down, um, uh, as you suggested in your question, uh, you can't learn from that. Um, and you're essentially hiding rather than solving your problem. Um, so there is attorney-client privilege, which is something that can shield the disclosure of that information, and you need to structure it, and that's where you, knew de where you do need to involve the lawyers to do that. Um, and then your next question is essentially how do you learn from this and how do you structure it? And to me it seems like, you know, kind of having random notes without a paradigm for how to, uh, you know, decide what it really means, where it fits within some structure, uh, is my way of saying you have to have some overlay and some kind of predefined hierarchy of issues so that you can assign the comments to those issues. You may learn from the comments that you have the wrong hierarchy. But, um, uh, you know, big data needs to be turned into something structured to be useful, and so does, you know, internal comments on how things are working. Okay. Uh, thank you. I have a few more here. Uh, Tony, I'll turn it back to you, and, and uh, I'll well, hold uh, my turn till later. Or you okay, want me to John, John, the audience is unusually quiet today, maybe because it's a, a topic that they're less familiar with, or maybe they're afraid to ask. Uh, questions in public that might incriminate them. I'm not sure. <laughs> but um, uh, let me jump in one that, that's um, uh, a bit related to the last one that you asked, John, which is, um, and we, we covered this somewhat uh, back in D.C. where uh, the question came up, you know, there's a lot of pressure to, to monetize data, to come up with ways to convert data into a product or, or leverage it as an asset. and um, it just seems like the, there are some obvious questions from a legal standpoint that that are likely to come up from that type of business strategy. So, Bill, um, you, you had a short checklist of, of things that people need to be aware of if they're looking to monetize data. Uh, could you could you touch on those? Sure. So uh, this kind of goes back to one of the questions that I'm seeing in front of me which is uh, uh, overlapping with the EU question. So before you can do something with data, you've got to check the law and see whether you're free to do it. And in many instances, uh, uh, you have to think ahead and you have to get consent to do it. Under EU law, there might just be an inherent limitation, which means you've got to segregate information from EU subjects um, from US or other subjects. Um, so that's the first question is, you know, before you do anything with the data, do you have the right to do it? Um, then to monetize it, uh, you can't monetize it unless you own it in such fashion that you can charge for it. And that's where it's a combination of IP protection with the stronger IP protection available to derivative data sets and treating it as, a, as an asset, as a piece of property is defined in the contract. Um, and then that would mean that the parties have to agree. Um, and agree may be the wrong word because you're going to walk in with a position or you're not going to do the deal, where X data is owned by X company, and now we talk about what does monetize mean. So that gets back to the contextual point I'm trying to say, which is you don't have to give away data for all purposes for all time. Um, and this is where IP and other licenses come in. That's the legal vehicle for saying you can take data and pay me for it, and use it to do X, Y, but not Z and not A, B, C, D, E. Because you don't want it to be competitive, you don't want to water it down. So from a legal point of view, it's wrapping it in protection and then granting the right to use it, which is another way of saying license, in a way that you're not uh, giving away all rights for all times, because that means you effectively can't monetize it when you only have one customer for it. So that requires um, an understanding of what the business objectives are and legal skills to make it work and 
underlying all this, I think in today's world, everybody's a frenemy, where they're both a competitor and a business partner. Uh, that complicates things. Lawyers see it all the time and, and work it out. But it is an issue, especially in kind of an Uber world of data sharing, um, where there's a lot of information gathered. And you can sell information because you don't really need it to move people around town. But somebody else will want to know, uh, you know, how many people go to this restaurant during this period. And I'm just making this up, but maybe that's information that an Uber type company could sell because it doesn't really care or it doesn't mind sharing that information and it certainly doesn't mind monetizing it. Okay. Um, uh, as we move on, I just want to apologize. I, I, I did say there were no questions, but I guess uh, they just weren't assigned to me. So Shannon has, has assigned them to me now and I can see them all. So. Um, oh, okay. I couldn't see any either. That's good. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, uh, there were two or three questions along similar lines. Uh, I, th I think uh, we'll we'll move past those just now. Uh, there's an interesting one that just came in. Though. Can you give an example of effective data retention algorithms that strike a reasonable balance between litigation risk and business value? That's, I think, where the work in progress is, and that's why I was trying to highlight that it's an emerging issue. Um, so is there an algorithm that will do this? Um, yes and no. I mean, a lot of this is a business judgment call that's specific to your company. So if the IT department or more likely an outsource provider can come up with that algorithm, then um, that's a good thing, and that's probably a workable thing and the only workable uh, technique because just the volume of data precludes uh, human you know, sorting by it. I, I will say that there are lessons here. I'm sure everybody who's not a lawyer has heard of the term e-discovery. Um, you know, under U.S. law, a lot of information has to be provided in the litigation, and uh, it was one thing when everything was kept in a file cabinet and paper. Uh, when everything is now kept in multiple computers um, and there are multiple copies of the same emails all over the place, uh, you know, e-discovery is a way to bring computer science to managing that. Um, and so some of the techniques that are used in e-discovery can be used to kind of reverse engineer it and decide what you keep and what you don't keep. Um, so that would be my short answer on that question. Okay. Um, uh, uh, one that hopefully might be quick is, is there any uh, resource available for a global organization to understand the different data privacy jurisdictions that exist around the world? Um, yes. I mean, there are publications. There are, you know, countries with no laws, countries like the U.S., which has sectoral laws, which is different rules. Uh, apply for different sectors. Um, so, you know, health, financial information, information used by children under 13, those are the U.S. categories which have special rules. Um, European rules are, you know, are very strict. Canada's rules are kind of in the middle. Um, Argentina has rules and other countries have rules. So there's two aspects of this. Yes, you can find books that kind of outline the rules. The real issue, however, though, is what's under consideration. And if you're going to build a compliance structure uh, and spend a lot of money doing it, you know, how do you build in what's likely to happen in the future or at least some flexibility for how to deal with it? So at some level, the existing books are going to be incomplete um, because you need kind of the expertise of someone who can make a judgment as to what trends are developing. An example, the EU is trying to come up with rules about cloud computing and where data is stored. Um, some of the rules probably aren't completely workable in a technological sense and aren't completely consistent with what even your European companies will want to do, but you need to speak with someone who can make a, a, judge, I'm sorry, a judged evaluation of how that is likely to turn out, or at least what you should do in anticipation of some form of that rule coming out. Okay. Uh, there's a couple of other questions about specific data sharing 
uh, examples. Um, uh, I might ask you to comment on these later, and because and, uh, we've spent some time on that already, uh, and we, we can't cover every context here. John, uh, you said you had some other questions in different areas, perhaps? Yeah. Um, I'd like to go back to the data breach uh, of statistic 63% caused by um, third-party providers. Could you provide a, a, an example of how third-party data has created a, a breach? Um, uh, uh, I think some people might be interested in in an example of that, because in my practice, I find uh, third-party data and cloud software uh, to be a real governance issue uh, in almost every company we are in. So an example uh, from that would be great. Um, so this study is a little bit different. This study focuses mostly on kind of the, uh, you know, the target type of breach, where as many people know, um, the attack was not directly on target, I guess no pun intended, it was on the HVAC contractor, which for some reason had been given access to the important parts of the network, and over a period of years, the criminals kind of took the entry point from the subcontractor and worked their way up ultimately to the swipe machines where the credit cards uh, were used and where the information was not encrypted for a very short period of time. So that's kind of the IT aspect. On the data aspect, I'm a little less sure on how to answer that, to be frank. But what I would say is that data is usually bound up in some kind of electronic format. And the electronic format, if it's not good, will have its weakness. To move on to kind of the Internet of Things uh, answer, so these Internet of Things are generating data, and the data is being collected. And, and, and then it's being acted upon, usually kind of automatically. Uh, and sometimes it's just being collected and it's gonna turn into enterprise data, which is gonna be filtered through an algorithm and, and used in the way I previously discussed. But from a breach point of view, uh, the simple answer is if you can network something, you can hack that network. Uh, and uh, you know, there have been examples where people walk around and cars that have, you know, those near-field control systems to unlock them, well, they can be uh, spoofed and someone can open your car and drive away with it. Um, so uh, is that data? Well, it's data to the extent that it's an encrypted code that can be broken. So there's a, a line between what's a gizmo and what's a piece of data, and in today's world, that's not an easy line to draw. So I think the Internet of Things carries with it um, uh, a risk not only of, of physical or logical security, but also you know taking information that the company wants to use for competitive advantage because someone can just get in and monitor it, even if they don't actually steal it. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, one um, other example that I have uh, uh, experienced, like if I could add to that, was a lot of uh, companies buy data about their customers from third parties to help further expand the demographics and psychographic type uh, information. And in the process of that interface, sometimes they open up their uh, environments to uh, an invasion because you have to have a hole drilled through your firewall, of course, so that data can come in. Um, so that was, an, and, uh, and uh, but the other example of uh, Target was um, exactly what I think people were looking for. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, Tony, I have another one if we have time. If not, I'll kick it back to you. Yeah, we're, we're really out of time, John. Uh, there was one contribution from uh, Dara O'Brien in Ireland I wanted to mention before we go. It was uh, in answer to one of the previously asked questions. He says, um, there are 111 laws. Uh, this is with respect to the uh, the question about a resource for uh, identifying data privacy regulations around the world. Uh, DLA Piper uh, has a global source book that has a high-level summary of data privacy rules worldwide. 
Um, that particular answer is in the Q&A, but it'll be distributed with the, the chat summary that Shannon sends out in a couple of days. Um, we are at our time, basically, so um, I, I think we should wrap it up here. Um, uh, I'll hand it back to Shannon in a moment, but I, I want to thank Bill Tannenbaum very much for joining us today. I uh, greatly appreciate your time and expertise, Bill. Thank you for that. Uh, John Labley, for your perspectives as always. Um, My pleasure. Uh, we always get asked the question, will the slides be distributed? Uh, yes, Shannon will look after that for you and send that with a link to the recording. Uh, so Shannon, back to you. Thanks, Tony, uh, and thank you, Bill, so much for joining us today, and John as well while you're on the road, as great pleasure as always. Uh, just as Tony mentioned, a reminder to everybody, I will be sending out a copy of the slide, or a link to the slides, a link to the recording, and uh, the additional information requested and commented throughout the webinar today uh, within two business days, so for this particular webinar by end of day Monday. Uh, and. Uh, thanks to all of our attendees, as always, for engaging in everything we do and being so interactive with all the, these great questions. Uh, and that's it. Bill, thank you so much again for joining us and, and for this great presentation. And uh, thanks, John and Tony, and I hope everyone has a great day. All right. Thanks, John. Goodbye, everybody.